Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Virtual Lab series of video blog presentations on various diverse scientific computing topics. As you can see here, the topic of today's presentation is on how first principle simulations in computational materials science and solid state physics can contribute to the investigation of novel crystalline structures that extend in space across a lower number of dimensions than the conventional 3D periodic structures. So, let us begin our main scientific presentation of today. Our everyday life unfolds in a three-dimensional space, a realm we are extremely accustomed to. We often refer to the two-dimensional planes as one level lower, and the one-dimensional lines and zero-dimensional points as even lower dimensions. This designation may seem somewhat unfair. For individuals who are well acquainted with two-dimensional planes, one-dimensional lines, and zero-dimensional points, what thoughts and images come to mind when they encounter the term low-dimensional matter for the first time? For instance, one possible misunderstanding when encountering the term two-dimensional material is picturing it as a completely flat plane with no thickness. However, we understand that all matter is composed of atoms, so even the thinnest material is thicker than a single atom. The same principle applies to one-dimensional and zero-dimensional matter. A line without thickness is not equivalent to a point without width. Regardless of how low-dimensional the matter may be, it still possesses a certain volume. In solid physics, the key criterion for determining the dimension of a material with a crystalline structure is periodicity. When you repeatedly stack the same Lego blocks on top of each other, it only increases the height of the structure. In this way, if you continue to build blocks larger than the size of the individual Lego blocks, it creates a one-dimensional cycle that repeats in just one direction. To aid in mathematical modeling, periodic boundary conditions are introduced, although every solid crystal inherently possesses a surface. For instance, a piece of metal with dimensions of 1 cm each for width, length, and height, resulting in a volume of 1 cm3, constitutes a three-dimensional metal, which may appear small in a macroscopic context, but can still be regarded as nearly infinitely periodic from a local atomic microscopic point of view. Matters that do not repeat in any direction are, on the other extreme, referred to as zero-dimensional materials. When you stack 100 identical Lego blocks on top of each other, is the resulting structure considered a zero-dimensional or one-dimensional material? If the properties of the material inside remain the same as the block thickness increases in the repeating direction, it can be categorized as having a one-dimensional crystal structure. On the contrary, a two-dimensional material exhibits two-dimensional periodicity, as a single unit repeatedly appears in two directions. Carbon, a well-known element, exhibits allotropes with diverse dimensions. Among the low-dimensional materials are soccer-ball-shaped fullerenes, also known as buckyballs, which belong to the zero-dimensional category and consist of 60 carbon atoms. Carbon nanotubes fall under the one-dimensional materials with repeating periods, while graphene is a two-dimensional material with repeating patterns. On the other hand, three-dimensional materials encompass diamond and graphite. The era of researching two-dimensional materials has commenced, starting with graphene, which is a single layer extracted from graphite and arranged in a stacked structure. Other materials, such as hexagonal boron nitride, HBN, stannine, germanine, and silicene, possess a monoatomic layer structure akin to graphene. Additionally, there are transition metal chalcogen compounds, TMDs, composed of three atom layers, slightly thicker mean, a material with carbon or nitrogen bonded to a transition metal, all of which are under active investigation. The first principle calculation method significantly contributes to research in discovering new two-dimensional materials. The first step in initiating the first principle calculation of a crystal structure involves establishing the unit cell, which acts as a repeating unit. When dealing with three-dimensional materials, the presence of three linearly independent lattice vectors, regardless of whether they are principal lattice vectors or not, poses no concerns. However, when performing calculations for two-dimensional materials, three-dimensional unit cells are still employed. This introduces a degree of freedom in determining the size of the lattice vector in the third direction, perpendicular to the two-dimensional plane, 
where the crystal structure lacks periodicity, leading to ambiguity in its determination. It is essential to find the right balance, as an excessively short length may cause unintended interactions between neighboring images. On the other hand, increasing the length results in higher calculation costs due to the rise in the number of FFD, fast Fourier transform, grid points. Since certain two-dimensional materials, such as TMDs and MEAN, consist of several atomic layers with a certain thickness, it is advisable to set the lattice vector in a manner that establishes a gap, often referred to as the vacuum gap size, between adjacent planes. A suitable range for the vacuum gap size is around 12 to 20 angstroms, rather than directly focusing on the lattice vector itself. Meanwhile, the vacuum gap size not only influences the calculation time but also impacts the total energy of the material being calculated. As a result, it becomes crucial to maintain consistent calculations when comparing relative energies between different materials or determining the energy of formation after adsorbing atoms or molecules onto two-dimensional materials. Additionally, it is essential to bear in mind that while the absolute value of the total energy can vary significantly depending on the size of the unit cell, the difference in energy, such as relative energy or formation energy, tends to converge relatively quickly. This convergence applies not only to the vacuum gap size but also when conducting energy cutoff or k-point convergence tests. Lastly, special attention should be given to doping calculations when dealing with two-dimensional materials. Introducing doping electrons or holes into a system during electronic structure calculations might seem straightforward since it involves specifying the number of electrons to add or subtract per unit cell in the input file. However, it is crucial to consider that depending on the amount of charge added or subtracted from the electrons, a compensating background charge is automatically generated to maintain the unit cell's electrical neutrality. This step ensures that the lattice structure's total energy, with its periodicity, remains stable. When a physically reasonable amount of electrons is doped, depending on the target system, this generally poses no significant issues. However, if an excessive number of electrons are doped, these additional electrons might prefer to occupy the vacuum gap, where a uniform positive background charge spreads, instead of entering the two-dimensional material already filled with other electrons. This behavior can be readily observed by examining the energy band after performing the electronic structure calculation. When comparing the electronic structure of undoped and doped materials, bands with S-like characteristics, i.e., energy levels that increase in a parabolic form from the zone center towards the zone boundary, may emerge near gamma points. Nevertheless, it is essential not to hastily conclude that a new state has arisen due to doping, as it could be embedded within the existing comfortable vacuum gaps. A straightforward method to verify this situation is by visualizing the charge density and identifying the spatial location of the state. For undergraduate students new to low-dimensional matter research, here are some essential points to consider regarding low-dimensional matter and first principle calculations. A beneficial study would involve comparing the energy bands obtained from the tight binding model in a straightforward system, like a one-dimensional grid or a two-dimensional square grid, with the results obtained from first principle calculations. This comparison will help gain a better understanding of the properties and behavior of low-dimensional materials. This brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. Many thanks for your attention. This presentation was provided in partnership with Virtual Lab, the company behind the development of the Materials Square online platform, for executing atomistic materials and chemical computations directly on the cloud. We therefore recommend to please give a try to the Materials Square simulation platform by visiting its corresponding website at www.materialsquare.com or more shortly matsku.com, as noted in the present slide or alternatively also in the video description below. Furthermore, please do not hesitate to contact us by email, as also shown here on this slide, in case you would like to obtain further information on the various R&D services and solutions for materials and molecular modeling applications that we can provide at Virtual Lab. Many thanks again for your interest and your consideration.